start again. Take two. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing, with copies of the recording being made available to those that request it. By being present at this meeting, it is likely that the recording cameras will capture your image and this will result in your image becoming part of the broadcast. You should be aware that this may infringe your human and data protection rights and if you have any concerns, you should speak to the uh, web casting officer. Members, I don't need to remind you again, but when speaking, turn the microphone on. When completed, turn the microphone off. And of course, I would like to welcome a number of members uh, for joining us tonight on internet. So um, we will keep a watch out for if you want to speak or contribute to the debate as we go along. Apologies for absence. None received, Chairman. Thank you. Declarations of interest? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much. Minutes of the last meeting. Can I take those as being agreed? Agreed. Reports of portfolio holders. Anyone with anything to add from a reports basis? No? Oh, Councillor Phillip. I'd just like to remind members, members who are here have probably noticed, but members who are not here probably haven't noticed that uh, as a result of us signing the lease on the top floor of this building uh, last week, uh, that includes several spaces in the car park and those are now out of bounds for us as members of staff and as councillors and uh, you should all have received an email about it. I encourage you to read that and uh, we're looking at how we deal with it. Okay, thank you very much. So Councillor Philip, has that completed now? Yes, leader. Excellent. That's good news for the council and uh, good news for Epping. Uh, Chairman. Yes, Councillor Murray. I'm desperately trying to get my hand up on the basis of that report. Uh, I've read the email carefully. Uh, I, I might be completely wrong in what I'm saying, but my understanding of it was we seem to have given up quite a lot of parking. Mm -hmm. And apart from the two, and I'm doing this from memory, so correct me if I'm wrong, the thing that did struck me is, apart from the two disabled bays in the basement parking, we've given up the entire parking in the basement uh, for weekends and evenings as well. And that, to me, seemed very excessive. Correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Philip, but my understanding from the email that we got on Friday is that even during uh, heavy winter months, which is when we might want to use it, uh, apart from, as I say, the two disability bays, we're not allowed to park in the uh, in the basement for evening meetings, and that to me seemed uh, a, a trifle uh, unnecessary and heavy. But I apologise if I got the wrong end of the stick. Councillor Phillip. No, Councillor Murray, you've got it exactly right, and it's exactly in line with the report that I brought to Cabinet when we agreed to uh, go forward with this leasing uh, agreement. Uh, Regis is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation. Uh, that includes some evenings, probably even nights and weekends, and therefore they, for their business model, do require access to that parking. Uh, that's the reason for the changes. And as I say, it was in uh, the report to Cabinet, and the diagram is in there as well. OK, well, just a final comment, Chairman. It's not unusual, but you've got a very unhappy Councillor Murray here in Loughton. OK. Your, your unhappiness is noted, Councillor Murray. Um, moving forward... Sorry, Councillor Holly Whitbread. Thank you. Just a really short report for me, just to remind members about the housing strategy uh, consultations. It was really great to see a number of members on uh, last week. I think it was on Thursday last week, a really good session. Um, but I would encourage members to watch that consultation briefing and also take part on the um, online surveys and encourage their residents to do so too. Thank you. Thank you. OK, moving forward. Item six, public questions and request to address the Cabinet. None, Chairman. Super. OK. Item seven, the report of overview and scrutiny. Councillor Sartin. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, the last meeting of ONS took place on the 18th of November. Uh, the, one of the items on the agenda referred to the call-in by Councillor Chris Pond regarding the planting of trees on Chessel Green. Um, there was to have been a follow-up meeting on the 6th of December, but this has now been cancelled following further discussions with officers, which have led to other ideas being put forward regarding where the tree should go. 
Uh, there still will be trees on Jessel Green. They're not um, <laughs> going to be uh, taken... Put, uh, there will be some around that area, but there will also be other parts of the district. I believe Limes Farm was one area and somewhere else as well was uh, mentioned. Uh, the committee looked at corporate plan, key action plan, and raised questions around several areas, including the green infrastructure strategy, housing for homeless families, and recycling collections, and noted that there had been an increase in absenteeism among staff, which some of that should seem to be due to mental health problems, which is obviously something that will be being monitored. We had a presentation from Naisha Pelaine, director of Harlow Gilston Garden Town, and Ione Braddock, uh, talking about the uh, Harlow Gilston Town transport strategy. This raised a number of questions and comments from members, and these would, will be fed into the report, which will be going to the January cabinet meeting. The extra meeting of ONS, which is taking place tomorrow evening, will be for a presentation and update from Princess Alexander Hospital. Originally, this was intended to be around the future plans for the hospital, but in view of the somewhat disappointing CQC report that had just been published at the time of our meeting, we will now have four officers from the Trust attending. They will be attending by Zoom. They will uh, be the... Chief Executive Officer Lance McCarthy, along with his Chief Operating Officer, the Director of Strategy, and new, the new Hospital Communications Officer. And that's at seven o'clock tomorrow evening. There was to be a second item on that agenda, but this has now been withdrawn as more work needs to be required on the item which was to do with the uh, new market policy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Sartin. Councillor Murray. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Just a couple of issues, uh, one positive and one not quite so positive. Uh, the Chairman's referenced the uh, call in about Jessel Green and the trees, and I just wanted to put on record that that is scrutiny at its best. Uh, the portfolio holder made an original decision with every best intention, nothing wrong with that, and then local members uh, called it in and we've got a much better decision because of that. So that's scrutiny working at its absolute best. And I want to put on record my thanks to uh, uh, my fellow Loughton councillors, the NRA councillors, for their hard work on this issue. Uh, secondly, and the chairman uh, mentioned it in her report, and I was glad that we've got this really important meeting uh, tonight, uh, tomorrow night. Uh, I think she... But obviously not deliberately, but I think she actually underplayed uh, the concern around the uh, report that we're going to uh, ask them about tomorrow. Uh, it was an alarming report, Chairman, uh, on virtually every criteria. Uh, the hospital was found to be unsatisfactory or needing improvement. Uh, it's a very alarming report. Uh, and when I read it, I was uh, staggered in part. I think I've got nine questions uh, sent in as soon as I read the report. So uh, I think it's a really important meeting and it's a really important piece of uh, scrutiny tomorrow night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Murray. Uh, Councillor Sartin, anything to add on that? Uh, no, nothing to add, but thank you to Councillor Murray for uh, bringing out those major points around it. And I think, you know, obviously, the PAH themselves realise the situation, the seriousness of it, the fact that they were originally just going to be sending two of their officers, um, they are now sending four, so hopefully we'll be able to cover a whole range of questions that have come out of the report, as well as looking at the issues around the new hospital. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on once again, members, on to item 8, the pay policy statement, pages 13 to 22, Councillor Sunga. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is the uh, pay policy statement. Um, it's a recommendation to um, Council, subject to any amendments or suggestions. Um, if I could just start to summarise, the Localism Act 2011 requires us to publish a pay policy statement setting out details of our approach to enumeration of our employees. There is specific uh, information the statement must include, such as Chief Officer remuneration, uh, remuneration of our lowest paid employees and the definition of lowest paid. Pay ratios between highest and lowest paid. 
uh, other payments for chief officers. The statement must be agreed by council and published on our website annually in March and April. It is retrospective to look at the remuneration. The pay policy statement is a statement of fact and does not set the policy for the council. Any pay policy strategy will be subject to member reports as required. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Small, I don't know if you would like to add anything to that. Thank you. Nothing to add, um, Chair. I think that sums it, up, sums it up nicely. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. First question, Councillor Patel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just um, a point of clarity. Uh, on page 22, Appendix A, um, we've got the terms uh, growth zone and exception zone. Um, what are they and how are they achieved? Councillor Sunder. Um, can I ask, can I invite Mr. Small, maybe perhaps, to comment on that? Thank you. Mr. Small? It's, it's, it's extra space in the salary grading to recognise exceptional um, performance, really, for, from individuals. So in, it's based upon um, those individuals demonstrating, um, as I say, uh, performance over and above what would be expected, really, and it's a chance to recognise and reward and retain, of course, those staff who are contributing the most to the organisation. Thank you. Councillor Patel. And, and, and how are the targets set? Are they uh, set for a normal appraisal process with performance-related uh, increments? That's correct, yes, as you would expect. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have Councillor Heap in the dark somewhere. Councillor Heap. Thank you. Uh, yes, does this fully reflect the, the pay that the top executives are getting? It doesn't include the uh, sums given by Qualis, does it? Is that part of this pay structure? Because we are picking up the slack. If they're working for Qualis for one day a week, then we're paying for nothing that day. Councillor Chairman, Sir. perhaps I can come in yep. from the Qualis customer Cal side point Cal of view. Yep. Qualis remuneration is not part of this. The uh, members of this um, council who do uh, additional work with Qualis as non-executive directors uh, the, that work is done out with the hours allocated for uh, Epping Forest work, so it's additional, uh, not part, not taking away from the amount of time that they can dedicate to working for Epping Forest. Uh, that's purely within the purview of Qualis and therefore does not come under our pay policy statement at all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Could I come back, Chairman? Um, yes, one more question, Councillor Heap. Um, I quite accept what uh, Councillor Phillips has just said, but if uh, two activities are happening in the same daytime, they can't both be done out of hours or excess of the hours. So that doesn't actually work as an answer because if they're attending a meeting for Qualis, they can't be at EFDC because it'll be done during the daytime. Councillor Phillips. Uh, Chairman, thank you for that. That's uh, a very old fashioned approach to working time frame. Um, you could say that anybody uh, working between nine and five have to be there from nine to five. I'm not convinced that any of our uh, senior executives work a nine to five day, uh, five days a week. They are a available out with those times. You're committed to a certain number of hours a week, as I am at my work. I don't necessarily do them between the nine and five each day either. Uh, it's up to me, uh, Georgina, as the chief exec, to make sure that the hours being given to Epping Forest. Uh, district Council are uh, in line with what's um, c contracted, and that's our role as uh, Head of Paid Service. Uh, that being said, I'm quite convinced that our uh, senior managers are well able to do that for themselves. I have no worries whatsoever that people are taking away time from Epping Forest District Council to work for, on Qualis work. It's quite possible, though, to divvy up your day to make sure that that runs sensibly, and uh, as Councillor Heat probably knows I've met uh, with most of the senior ma managers out with a nine to five time for various reasons at various times. Exactly. Thank you very much. Castor Wixley. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's not a question on the agenda, but I, I just wonder if it's a technical problem because the sound is coming over very quiet to me. I, I can hear members, fellow members are on Zoom, but it's quite difficult to hear what people are saying or are speaking in the chamber. I'm not sure what that problem will be, Mr. Khan. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I can only really suggest that members in the room speak 
a little closer to their microphones, which may help the situation. Okay, we'll try our best. I'll turn your up on Zoom. Jim, this might tie into uh, the capital uh, allocation in my report for uh, updating the council <laughs> chambers. I think this just demonstrated a really good reason why this is necessary. If, if it helps you, Chairman, I've heard everything. I might not have heard what I've heard. Like what I've heard, but I've heard everything very clearly. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Murray. That's superb. Okay. So we've got the recommendations on the pay policy statement. Are we happy to agree those? Agree. Thank you very much. Okay. Item nine, calendar of council meetings, 22-23. Councillor Kane. Thank you, Leader. Uh, yes, um, that time of year again, where we're looking at um, setting out the council calendar for the forthcoming year. Um, as usual, we've tried to make our meetings uh, follow a sensible and logical order so that scrutiny becomes uh, before cabinet and, and full council. Uh, we've done our best wherever we can to uh, fit everything in, um, trying to keep the tail end of December quiet and avoided as many uh, religious uh, uh, festival days as we possibly can. Um, so it is what we see in front of us at the moment. Um, it's been looked at through scrutiny as well. We've made as many adjustments as we can uh, and hopefully um, members will find it's acceptable and uh, we can uh, go forward and uh, adopt the, the, uh, the new calendar. Okay, thank you very much. Members? No, nope. Councillor Murray, did you want to speak on this item? I did put my hand up, but actually Councillor Kane has mentioned what wasn't in the written report, unless I missed it, that uh, you had done your best to uh, miss uh, religious festivals. I think that's important. We live in a multicultural uh, community and uh, I think we need to miss the uh, major religious festivals as possible. Wasn't mentioned in the report, but he mentioned it verbally. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Holly Whitbread, did, do you want to speak? No, okay. Any other members? No. Can we take that as being agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We then move on to item 10, local council tax support scheme. Councillor Kane again. Thank you very much. Um, yep, again, at that time of the year, um, we are required to uh, provide this tax support scheme. It remains unchanged. Um, any changes would have required going out to consultation, um, but we're just rolling over the, uh, the existing scheme with the existing terms. So uh, hopefully we'll have no problem um, adopting this uh, scheme. Okay. Members, any questions on this standard report for each year now? No. Therefore, I'll go to Councillor Murray. Thank you, Chairman. Apart from the budget, this was the uh, main reason why I wanted to join this meeting, because uh, I don't regard it as a standard issue. Uh, first, I think there's a number of things that have to be noted. Uh, isn't it amazing how uh, the national government since 2013 has moved what was a national scheme of council tax benefit to almost totally uh, one that has to be financed through local count, uh local taxation. Uh, that's a, an amazing deft of hand over the last uh, uh, eight years. Uh, in my discussion with the officer uh, about this, uh, we don't even get the cost of the admin uh, that it costs us to administer in the uh, government grant anymore. So I think members need to be aware of this. It's all part of the localism agenda. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely wonderful, but localism has really been a transfer of expenditure from the uh, from the national government to uh, to the local government. That's a general issue around this. Uh, I'm not suggesting we change it now because we're tying in with quite a lot of other local authorities in the sense that we run a similar scheme, and I know that there would have to be public consultation if we made changes. But I am just kind of flagging up uh, some changes that I might personally, and obviously it would be up to the council and the cabinet to go along with them. Uh, we made a big thing uh, at a recent council meeting where we had a discussion about the impact of the universal credit reduction. We made a big thing about what the council was doing on uh, 
on the ground locally. That was the kind of main defence of, uh, uh, you know, uh, against the motion. Well, we're doing this and we're doing that. It's quite clear within the report that we're not actually exercising our full discretion uh, within this to, uh, to help the most needy. Uh, we could have a, uh, a higher rate of calculation. For example, the support is based on 75% of the council tax bill rather than all the council tax bill. I'm not suggesting for one moment that we change it tonight. And I'm not suggesting necessarily that we automatically change it next year. But I am just saying that it isn't a rollover issue and there are some general principles that we need to look at a, a, a really hard look at. Because I do understand that if we made significant changes that benefited the most vulnerable, it would be coming from the rest of the council taxpayer. I, I do understand that. Uh, but I, I just don't want members to see this as a rollover each year and that there aren't issues that need to be discussed. So the fact that the support is based on 75% of the council tax bill rather than 100% of the council tax bill, I do believe is something that should be looked at in uh, future years. And this exceptional hardship scheme uh, for, for the scheme, yes, it is there to support people whose individual circumstances are causing them real hardship, uh, but I'm not sure how many people really know that it's there. And uh, perhaps I would like to know how much we actually publicise that. So I think those are the issues that I wanted to raise tonight, but uh, I would like to see some some changes in the scheme that was brought forward uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Murray. Uh, Councillor Kane. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Um, yeah, interesting observations. Uh, might I suggest it might be something you wish to take to overview and scrutiny to uh, have the uh, discussion there as to uh, whether you consider the uh, the current scheme as fit for purpose going forward. Uh, it might be an opportunity to discuss it there. With regards to the hardship fund, it is a very small pot of money there to help out those uh, who are in most need um, on the back of this scheme. So uh, uh, yes, certainly open to discussion, uh, but I think for, for Neil, certainly as you say yourself, um, we will go forward with this, uh, assuming uh, my Cabinet uh, colleagues uh, agree to this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Therefore, can we agree those recommendations, members? Agree. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, well, we then move on to agenda item 11, Harlow and Gilston Town Rolling Infrastructure Fund. Councillor Bedford. Thank you, Leader. Uh, first of all, I think it's uh, appropriate to welcome May Shepelin to our meeting this evening from Harlow Gilston Garden Town Board. And also, I believe Ione Braddock is on the call as well. So, uh, good evening, Ione. Uh, the report is before members this evening there to agree the memorandum of understanding. Uh, three terms are laid out at the top there for our decisions that are required this evening. This report requests that EFDC Cabinet agrees a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, around the Rolling Infrastructure Fund, which is shortened to RIF. It's for submission to Homes England, the RIF was a key component of the Hertfordshire County Council's bid for housing investment grant money for the works to upgrade the central stalk crossing and to build the eastern stalk crossing. £171 million in funding was awarded via the Housing Investment Grant, or HIG, by Homes England, and the rolling infrastructure forms part of the recovery and recycling strategy for this money. The recovery and recycling strategy permits the 171 million funding to be recycled through incoming developer contributions, which can then be used to fund the investment uh, future infrastructure items. For the RIF to be set up and managed effectively, the objectives, the guiding principles and the governance arrangements need to be agreed by the five Garden Town Local Authority partners. In an enabling memorandum of understanding, an MOU in the first instance, the draft MOU has been through extensive consultation with officers of all partners in the preparation phase of the MOU. And as part of this report, the final draft MOU is appended to the report as Appendix A. Homes England has been updated and that it has been ratified by the Harlow Gilson Garden Town Board in time for the 30th and 11th milestone. 
and is currently proceeding through the respective governance of the five partner authorities for them to ratify it individually through their respective cabinet or executives. The final MOU will then be submitted together with the HIG recovery and recycling strategy to Homes England to satisfy the conditions of the HIG funding. The RIF itself, once created and operational, will be a key mechanism for future funding of infrastructure to enable the realisation of the Garden Town vision and the achievement of an ambitious modal shift target. Uh, the three recommendations are as laid out on the report at the front. Uh, I won't read those out again. Uh, any questions? Members, Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. I, I support the idea of this. I think uh, the Rolling Infrastructure Fund is a very good idea um, and it allows us to progress with uh, infrastructure before we have the development that will actually end up funding it. Once we have that fund, that, that money from the developers, that's what makes the infrastructure fund rolling. However, I have a real concern around the resource implications. Uh, it calls out quite clearly that potential resourcing from all the HGGT authority partners, uh, and then on page 46, uh, it's not clear what those are going to be, the financial contributions from Epping Forest District Council. They're not, good, they're not clear yet. It's very difficult to fully support an MU, MOU where those uh, funding uh, requirements are not clear, uh, except for me to say, as you've probably heard me say once or twice this year, and no doubt will continue, there, there is no money. Um, we are really tightly squeezed already. Um, I'm a little bit reassured that it uh, will be developed in the context of the Council's financial position going forward, uh, which is enough, I think, probably to let me support this tonight. But I'm just laying it on the table that there will be no additional funding for this. Councillor Bedford. Thank you. I forgot to turn my microphone off. You forgot to remind me. Never mind. Uh, I don't know if Naisha wants to comment on that. It might be helpful. Aisha. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the, um, the, the resourcing to develop the rolling infrastructure fund, which is the next part of what we have to do, um, the resourcing to do that is already in place through baseline funding that's provided by the three LPAs um, and is already in your budget. Um, in addition to that, we're looking to additional contributions from the county councils, which we're waiting to hear if be confirmed in January. Um, and we will also be bidding for funding from Homes England for capacity funding from the government. Um, that pot of money, uh, we believe, will probably get us to, to about ish a million pounds probably somewhere between 800 and a million pounds to enable us to do the capacity building work for the garden town in general and this in particular i think what i draw your attention to is the prize here um, so the prize is 171 million in the future which will be of significant benefit to um, epping forest district council but alongside that there'll be additional funding coming in from other contributions and i see this pot probably being 250 to 300 million in the future. What I need to be able to do looking towards that future period, and when I talk about the future, we're talking about three years, it's not that far in the future, is to be able to work uh, to develop potentially an investment fund that we can work with the private sector to help it grow for the benefit of the overall spatial growth. So that's the plan. I don't believe there will be additional resources in the short term, they're already in place. And also, we will be able to draw on the fund in order to capitalise our resource costs going forward into the future, if that provides some reassurance. Yeah, thank you very much. Councillor Phillip, does that help your uh, dilemma? That certainly helps, and uh, the, the, the reassurance that we're not going to be looking for more funding, given, given the report I'm, I'm bringing later, is, no, no. is very, um, very helpful. And as I said at the beginning, I'm fully in support of what it is we're trying to do. I think the, the prize is definitely worth trying to get there. I'm just highlighting that we have a financial squeeze at the moment. No, I think it's very important to be aware of it, and it, it's good to hear um, the potential for this fund in, in the future and what infrastructure it could yeah. deliver for us uh, as we move forward. Uh, any other members? No? Okay, I've got no one wanting to speak online. Um, we've got the recommendations before us. Can I agree those recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, then when item 12, we're back to Councillor Kane, off-street car parks. Thank you, Leader. Yes, indeed. Um, parking review. Uh, last time we did this was in uh, 2015, and oddly enough, it was my job last time as well. 
um, which uh, might, might tell you something about um, the way that um, the leader considers my position here. Um, <laughs> on page 65, if I may just divert your attention to the bottom of page 65, table two, the proposed tariff structures, appears to have got a bit mangled on the last three lines, uh, in as much as it's lost Sunday uh, and, and the rates for Saturday. So rather than referring to table two, if I can highlight um, recommendation 1C and 1D, makes it clear what the proposals are for Saturdays and Sundays. Um, as you can see, generally speaking, we're only making real changes at the lower end of the timescales with a, uh, uh, an increase from 20p to 30p for the first 30 minutes. Uh, where we have split bands of 80 and 90p for up to an hour, we're making it a flat one pound. And for up to two hours, um, it's going up uh, again to two pounds. The rest of the rates, by and large, are the same as they have been previously, with the exception of the Saturdays and Sundays, as laid out in 1C and 1D. Um, there's a couple of other proposals in there um, to remove the uh, one hour free charging from the civic offices here. Um, the Sunday free allowance will remain. Um, bring Beaumont Park Drive car park into, um, in, into the fold, as it were, in terms of uh, charging, making a, a consideration for some of the exceptions at Beaumont Park. Um, retaining our weekend and bank holiday parking during the month of December. Blue badge free parking, of course, and for motorbikes. Slight increase for um, permits and season ticket holders and the introduction of business and resident permits in Cornmill Car Park, Waltham Abbey, which is underutilised as, as a car park, and business permits in Oakwood, Oakwood Hill East Car Park. Um, so, happy to take questions. I have my officers with me here as well to assist. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Kane, I know there's a particular query around Royden that uh, Councillor Sarton would like to raise. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, thank you for allowing me to come in ahead of your... Uh, cabinet members. Uh, yes, I, I was taken aback uh, by the fact that this was in the um, agenda because I haven't had a heads up on it. It is a question that has been raised before. We have had meetings in the past around it. Are we, I, I note within the report that it is the only car park within the district, owned by the district, that does not charge at this time. That said, it is the only car park that is in a village. The other car parks are all in towns with the facilities, the shopping facilities and other um, doctor surgeries, opticians, etc., cetera, um, in, in the towns, which are not available to residents or people coming into Royden to park. The only um, facilities in Royden are a village shop, which is too far away from the uh, car park for anybody to use that. There is the hairdresser, who obviously does get clientele coming in and using the car park, but I think would be concerned about the effect on her business if charging was brought in. And uh, there is an estate agent, which obviously also um, I would imagine uses the car park. I haven't got any knowledge of that one. Uh, so those are the only businesses within the, the village. The way in which the recommendation is put to cabinet members asks you to agree full tariffs be reviewed be introduced as of now, well, as is when this uh, comes into pl uh, place in April. Uh, I did have an email conversation with Mr Warwick on this, and the response that I got from him suggested that you're doing this the wrong way around. Uh, it was that you accept this recommendation and agree that full tariffs be brought in, after which a full feasibility study will be carried out which, in my mind, a feasibility study is to see whether it's worthwhile bringing in tariffs. So I actually would ask members this evening to, uh, I don't expect you to withdraw the suggestion completely, but at least to reword that recommendation um, along the lines of to carry out a full feasibility study into whether tariffs should be brought in for Bowman Park Drive um, and that study should include consultations with the residents who currently have to use it um, uh, because they have no off-street parking and 
uh, also to consult with the local businesses, as I've just said, there are very few, and the school. The school is not going to bring any income into this um, subject, uh, proposal because obviously it suggested that they shouldn't have to pay. It would be drop off and pick up times. The school does have its own car park, so it is only the parents coming along for that. It's, it shouldn't be the school staff that are using it. So, as I say, I would just like a slight change or a change to that recommendation that you do not at this point in time agree that full tariffs be introduced now, but that you do what should be doing be done first, a full feasibility study, and then look at the results of that to come back to decide whether or not uh, charges should be brought in. Uh, I could give more history to the car park itself, but I don't think this is perhaps the time to do so. Thank you, Councillor Sarting. Councillor Kane. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Sarting. Um, yes, of course, I'm uh, aware of the special circumstances around Beaumont Park. Um, we did uh, include the statement that we'd be looking at those issues there, but I take the point that it maybe it is a bit backwards. So can I propose a change to uh, 1F to read, to agree full tariffs to be introduced in Beaumont Park Drive car park, subject to the completion and satisfactory um, outcome of a full review and consultation. Councillor Sartre. That's almost still suggesting that it's a fait accompli. I would rather slightly change, slightly more softening the words. I'm happy for you to choose the words. <laughs> if you could, I mean, you're still saying a full um, tariffs be brought in um, subject to a feasible study. I would think more along the lines of if the feasibility study shows that it, it would be worthwhile both financially and for benefiting the residents of the village. Um, I'm sure somebody can fashion a set of words, somebody in a far better place than I can do that, um, to, to, do, to achieve that. Whether we can um, both satisfy the financial question and the full satisfaction of your residents, um, that will be a moot point, I think, uh, for any car park discussion. Yes, uh, th thank you for that. Yes, I, I think you know, at least it gives uh, time to look at it properly before the, any final decision is taken and then obviously come back to Cabinet with that final decision. Um, as I said before, it, it is a village car park. It's not in the same uh, realms of the town centre ones that are obviously bringing in money. Uh, one of the questions that I did ask of Mr Warwick but I haven't had a response to is how much has actually been spent on maintenance on that car park after over the past two or three years because I suspect not a great deal. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Kane. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point on the amendments to 1F. Um, I've just had a very quick word, and we couldn't conduct this uh, consultation prior to the 1st of April. So what I'm trying to avoid here is to have the wording reflect uh, a position that wouldn't require coming back to Cabinet for final confirmation. That's, that's my only concern with the rewording. I would have thought, thanks Councillor Kayla, I would have thought the income from this would be under 30,000. 30, I'm not sure where Cabinet decisions can be made by portfolio holders. Could be a portfolio holders uh, report if necessary. Uh, assuming uh, everybody's happy with that, we can just make it a portfolio yep. holder decision on one end. Yeah. Councillor Phillip. Chairman, I think the basic principle of the report is valid in that we should charge for our car parks. Um, if, if uh, as Councillor Sarton is suggesting, perhaps there hasn't been a huge amount of maintenance on that car park, um, that's fairly reasonable given that it's uh, not making any money. I, I'm I understand where Councillor Sarton is coming from, but I certainly think that uh, in terms of the report in front of us, we should be looking to agree this is what we're going to do unless it's proved to be uh, inadvisable as a result of the uh, work that uh, Councillor Keane does going forward. Uh, if it is found inadvisable, then, I, I, some, then you'd have a portfolio holder decision or, or bring it back yeah. to cabinet but I would like to get the principle in place first yeah um, I, I would suggest on, on, in, on this particular car park and I think uh, Councillor Avery and Councillor Sartin may agree with me um, we did and Councillor Kane we, we all went down to inspect the car park five years ago plus now um, and at the time it had no CCTV uh, it has no meterage in place if I remember rightly 
Um, it's only used by residents of the area. In fact, I think it was an unofficial, unwritten word that the uh, development around there was on the basis that the residents could use the car park because they were displaced. Um, when I've, I've attended parish council meetings down there, there's been a number of complaints about lack of CCTV, and I think to bring that up to standards, and I think this is why the consultation is a good idea, I, I, I think that we may find that when we do the consultation to bring it up to the standards of our other car parks could be quite considerable, if, if possible. Um, and I just think the consultation needs to be done. I'm not saying I'd rule it out, um, because if there's an income, you're quite right, Councillor Philip, we need to make sure that we, uh, we, we take income from all our car parks, if, if possible. I just think this is very much a village car park and not a um, town centre car park of any type, um, including others that we, we get concerned about from time to time. Councillor Sartin, you wanted to come back. Uh, thank you, Chairman. No, it was, I, I fully re, uh, accept the fact that financial issues do come in on this and that it is one of those things that is unfortunate in this day and age. I, Councillor Whitbread did make reference to the residents and the use of it. The original car park was put in in the 1980s, and at that time, uh, sometime in that period, double yellow lines were put outside a, lo a number of houses. It was 14 houses in total, which meant had no off-street parking, and they were to park. And the, the verbal agreement at that time was that they would have free car parking in this car park. Obviously, I doubt if there'll be anything written anywhere along the lines that would show that to be the. Uh, the case, but I, obviously that has been given to me as a verbal as the fact over the years. Um, just on numbers of cars using it, and again, I think that's what should form part of any feasibility study. Any time that I go into it, it, is, it has got about 40 spaces in total, never full, less than half full usually, except at the period of time when schools are being children are being dropped off for the school. Uh, so again, that has got to be taken into account on the amount of income that's going to come from it because it's certainly not used as a commuter car park. Uh, commuters are not prepared to walk that distance down to the station and going on the charges that you're putting forward here at the moment for a full day's commuter parking, they would actually be cheaper using the station car park than the Royden Village car park would be coming up to. So just a couple of other points just to throw in there. Okay, Councillor Sartre, I think we've got an agreement that we're going to uh, do some consultation on this and uh, the relevant wording will be put forward, but I take on board Councillor Phillips' point as well that we do need to make sure we get all income we can. I just have a feeling on this one it's not feasible, possibly, but uh, won't rule anything out. I've got Councillor Bedford waiting. Thank you. There's a question for Councillor Kane and probably needs to be answered by the officers, actually. Uh, on the permits and season tickets, item... Uh, I. To increase resident parking permit charges from 50 to 55, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think that's fairly reasonable in today's current climate. However, there is something missing from there, and, it, and we haven't included the book of tickets that residents are able to buy for visitor parking. Uh, I wonder if you might be able to tell us what the current charge is. I think it might be a pound a day for a resident parking permit for uh, someone attending. And there's obviously an opportunity there for a very slight increase there, which would help Councillor Fidget, uh, Phillips budget. Councillor Kane. As you rightly guessed, I'm going to defer to Mr Warwick. <laughs> <laughs> Mr Warwick. Thanks. Um, in terms of the visitor um, park uh, tickets, is this referring, if it's on straight, yeah. we don't get any of that income because it's, it goes to NAP. Yeah. Um, and I think... The, yeah, I, I can come back with the actual on-street charges for NAP. We haven't got, um, on Appendix A, are the on-street prices, but it hasn't got the visitor prices. But I can come back to you, Councillor Bedford, on that. Thank you. I, I think the reason being that, uh, although we're providing the permits, the on-street parking, if you know someone, you can buy a book of tickets on 20 quid, get paid to the person that you're hiring from, then that's adding to the pressure that we're having on our existing car parks. So a slight increase there, if it, even if it's net, I think it's warranted. Okay, thank you. I've got Councillor Patel, then Councillor Sartin wants to come back. Thank you, Leader. Um, I prefer the, the fact that we are increasing um, 
um, the tariff charges to round figures. I think they're increasing, particularly one hour and two hours from uh, 90 pence to one pound and uh, one pound 80 to two pound is better for, for those that are still um, dealing in cash. I know out of the 22 um, off-street car parks, have, have all of the uh, machines now been fitted with um, electronic um, card readers uh, to make payments? Um, and just one further question around the, con um, the consultation and, and the lead-in to, um, the, lead to uh, the implementation on the 1st of April. Um, from memory, um, I think the last time uh, that, that this was reviewed and, and um, changes were made to the car park in charges, um, it perhaps could have been handled in a in a better way in terms of the the way in which it would, um, the, the increased charges were advertised, um, particularly the signage uh, being clearer, particularly uh, in Buckers still on the, at the uh, the car park at the top of Queens Road. Uh, I've received quite a few complaints at that time when those charges were. Uh, were increased and just wondering in terms of the, the leading period to when the, sign, the new signage goes up, um, can we make sure that it's you know it's clear um, and that residents are are um, it's clear to residents when they want to make their payments? Thank you, Councillor Kane. Uh, well, of course we'll uh, make uh, any such announcement uh, in good time and uh, we'll make the signage as clear as we possibly can. Um, not too sure what you're aiming at with the uh, Bucket Steel one, perhaps we can have a chat afterwards and uh, just you can explain exactly what's going on there. Um, with regard to the, your other question, just remind me the first bit. Um, the, first, the first question was around the, the 22 off-street car parks that we have. Um, how, many of, uh, how many of the machines are, um, have, have got the facility to make car payments? That I don't know, Mr Warwick. <laughs> Apologies, Councillor Patel, I'll get, uh, get back to you. I believe all of them have, but I will double check and uh, I'll let you know if that's okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Sarton, you wanted to come back. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. No, it was just following on from Councillor Bedford's uh, question around uh, visitor parking. That was one of my concerns as well around uh, if charges are being brought into, and I'm afraid locally we refer to it as bakery close car park, not Bowman Drive. But anyway, that's... <laughs> um, that obviously these houses that have the WO lines outside them at the junctions of the Harlow Road, Epping Road and High Street, any visitors to them would then be finding themselves, unless you can do visitor parking permits for those ones, paying six pounds a day to visit their friends. So that's another thought to be given to that particular car park. Thank you, I'm sure we'll resolve it. Now, Councillor Brooks has been waiting very patiently. Councillor Brooks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Whitbread. Just a couple of things, really. Uh, a comment and a query. Um, I did come to Stronger Place, where we did discuss the car parking charges. I found it very interesting because the officers had consulted uh, all members, and I know at times all of us are overwhelmed with emails, but I did believe they got only about a quarter, less than a quarter of members responded. But there seemed to be a bit of a rebellion about the, the charges, and I'm really glad that we've gone back to the original idea and those proposals, because I think they were very fair. We've lost a lot of money, a lot of, of often you put in a pound anyway, because you haven't got the change. But there is one query. Now I know in Waltham Abbey, exceptions were made a few years ago, and we have those few spaces where you've got two hours free parking. It was really the loss of the one hour at the Civic um, was this made because there's going to be very little space anyway, uh, or was it made for financial reasons? Because in the past, I've sometimes been with families who have been in very difficult financial circumstances and needed urgently to see a, an officer. And um, it sounds not much, but when you're in heavily in debt, a couple of pounds is quite a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Councillor Kane. I think the, um, bringing the, uh, the council car park is, is just to uh, bring it in into the fold, as it were. Um, I mm. don't know exactly um, how much of an impact maintaining that um, one hour free slot would be. Um, don't really know how to take that forward, actually, because 
if we start making you know exceptions to this, this is perhaps something we could have come up at, at scrutiny. I don't know if Mr. Warwick wants to comment at all on the uh, on the value of that. Mr. Warwick, thank you. Um, Councillor Kane's correct. It, the reason of removing the one-hour charge um, is to become consistent with all the other car parks. Um, from a financial um, modelling point of view, it, it, there's little difference. So, um, yeah, the reason was f for consistency. Um, so if members are happy for us to keep that in, we can. I think, think we need to look at the impact it has. I, t I take on board it doesn't have a major impact. Um, but, of course, it is a high street car park as well. And I think we have to remember that when we're looking at it. So uh, perhaps if, if Councillor Kane is looking at any minor changes um, to bring forward as a, on a portfolio holder basis, you can do that. That would be OK. Councillor Phillips. Yeah, just on that, perhaps rather than uh, taking it out of the consistency, of the rest, we, we look at if there's a way, a bit like, for example, the Sainsbury's car park in Loughton, where we could reimburse somebody in a, an appropriate case. Uh, I think that might be a, a better way than actually treating yeah. it differently. I, I think um, that, that's a good point, Councillor Philip, and maybe a good way forward. It, it is the, the specific um, car park as, as such, and we, we should have the opportunity to offer that uh, if, if required. But uh, other than that, it is a high street car park. OK, thank you very much. Thanks for raising a good point, Councillor Brooks. Councillor Murray. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I want to divide my comments into two parts. One, the actual issue on the agenda, and then secondly, the uh, procedure that I've seen witnessed at Cabinet tonight on this issue. Uh, I'm not convinced that we should be treating all car parks the same. Uh, I think uh, our towns are very different. They have very different economic stance as uh, issues around them. Uh, they have very different user groups. So I have to say I'm not convinced that we should be treating all our car parks exactly the same. Uh, I don't think that makes good economics. Uh, I'm not against car parking charges because I see them as part of car park ownership. I'm in the car. I don't have a problem with that at all. But uh, And I also, as part of the report, I realised that it was probably part of the background papers, would like to have seen more about the costs of uh, running the service vis-à-vis -vis these increases and, uh, and so on. Uh, so that's my comment on the issue. Uh, I just have to say that I'm quite staggered in some ways by uh, how the needs of uh, a well, well put forward case in Royden has been, uh, has been considered. I com completely agree with what Councillor Sartin has said and done, and I have every sympathy with her. But when I compare that to far bigger issues in Loughton, where we were just totally ignored, totally ignored. Councillor Sartin said at the start of her contribution that she felt she hadn't been uh, kind of involved in the issue around her car park. Well, perhaps she can empathise with us Loughton councillors who knew absolutely nothing about a £23 million purchase of half the high road. Not a word, not a word of consultation. Uh, so perhaps Mary, uh, Councillor Sarton can be very sympathetic about that. And I'll make just one other point. We put forward really good, concrete ideas around something as major as the uh, retail park, and we were completely ignored. And now you've got Councillor Mrs Sarton making excellent points about a small village car park and the cabinet is entertaining everything she says, which is absolutely right. I don't have any problem with that, but what a difference. And I think we all know the reason why, don't we? What a difference. It just speaks volumes, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Philip, you're itching to come back. I, I am. I, I've said this to Councillor Murray before, um, but he mistakes the difference between listening to something, weighing it up, and coming to a different conclusion from totally ignoring. That's not the case in the places he's, he's referenced. Um, as Councillor Murray will remember, there's been certain times where points that he's put forward have been listened to and 
taken action on, if you remember quite clearly, uh, when we looked at the high streets within the district. He made a persuasive case that Loughton High Road and the Broadway should be treated as two separate places, which we did do. So we do listen, uh, and as Councillor Murray obviously also missed, uh, I was not uh, in agreement with what Councillor Sarton was suggesting, so it's not a case of rolling over and having your tummy rubbed, uh, as much as he might like that to be the case. Uh, so we do listen, we just don't <laughs> always agree with what he's saying. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Philip. I'm not sure the uh, getting your tummy rubbed would go down well with yourself somehow. But uh, and, and I think actually the, the points put forward and strongly put forward by Councillor Sartin, as with any member who attends cabinet and pops forward a, an argument, we listen and um, there was debate within the cabinet about those comments. So uh, I don't take on board what uh, Councillor Murray is saying on that. On the other points, uh, Councillor Kane, the uh, idea that we should have individual tariffs for each and every car park. Any thoughts? Um, yes, I have thoughts, and uh, in short, no. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, we had, in 2015, we looked to differentiate between the rates for commuter towns against well, Mabby and Onga, um, and it makes no difference, the, uh, the, no. the value. Um, where we thought we were protecting uh, the commuter car parks, um, we won't. Um, it, we just charge commuters more for their uh, for the privilege. Um, it's it's about getting um, a, an even expectation of car parking charges for all of the district. If you park in Buckhurst Hill or if you park in Onga, you should know what you're going to be paying. Uh, absolutely, and I think actually there are. This has been built well because it builds upon what we did in 2015. And actually, the good thing of having the same portfolio holder in place to actually look at it again is um, it means that you've got that background knowledge of what we've done before. And in fact, um, it helps with those uh, the consultation that will be done over Royden and um, the other areas that you may want to tweak. Um, it helps because you've got that background knowledge. Uh, which other members don't have. And of course, uh, did I note that it's gone to a select panel as well for um, debate, which is something that we've tried to do more and more, is to, to get the, the uh, feelings of scrutiny before uh, we go any further. So, members, we've got these recommendations before us this evening. It's never an easy subject, parking charges, never a popular one, I'm afraid. Um, but of course, it is an important income stream for the council at a time when finances are difficult and uh, Councillor Philip will be giving you a report shortly um, that underlines that. Um, with the slightly amended recommendations which will be agreed between Mr Warwick, Councillor Kane and uh, Adrian when the uh, minutes are written up, can I take those as being agreed? Agreed. Councillor Patel, I'll let you come back one time. No, I just wanted to make the, po make the point because I, I was, um, I think it was a um, task, task and finish group, on, not task and finish group, there was, there was, I think there was a working group on um, carrying out the reviews back in 2015 on, on car parking and charges and I, and, and I was involved in, in that working group and I think at the time what, what was quite difficult was that we couldn't gauge accurately um, the number of residents that were purchasing 30 minutes, one hour, two hours and the recommendation came forward at that time to pur purchase smart uh, machines, which now enabled this discussion yeah. really and, and allowed us to accurately ca um, calculate uh, income streams uh, for the various different uh, categories. So I think it was the right choice for us to be making at that time. Yeah, of course our evidence base is so much stronger now and what I would remind members is the devastation to our parking income during the pandemic. Um, I still think we're only at about 40% of capacity in our, most of our car parks. Yeah, so I mean this is a real challenge to the council and it will be an ongoing challenge and of course we want um, our car parks to be vibrant because that's how we keep our high streets vibrant as well. So um, I, I think the way that we've organised this, the evidence base that's been used, the fact it's gone through the select panel, all members have had an opportunity to have their say. Um, we have come up, I think, with the best best solution at the moment. But um, okay, so can I take those recommendations as altered as been agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. 
Okay, we then move on to item 13, quarter two budget monitoring. Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman, and just highlighting the fact that this actually has already been to this <coughs> the Stronger Council Select Committee in early November. Um, it's due to the timings of the Cabinet meetings that this is uh, somewhat after the end of uh, quarter two. <coughs> Essentially, um, the, key, the high notes are that the general fund position that we've got to at the end uh, of the second quarter is a significant improvement over where we were at the end of the first quarter. Uh, the key parts we've actually brought um, our expenditure uh, under what we expected for from a budget point of view. We're, we're currently um, about 130,000 underneath where we expect to be. That's clearly an important thing in terms of us trying to reduce our pressure on our um, pressure on our reserves as we go forwards, because we had uh, banked on putting, taking uh, 1.3 million out of our reserves this year. We are obviously aiming to try and uncut that, undercut that as much as possible, so we can keep more in our reserves. Chairman, I'm not going to go through this on a page by page because, as I say, we've been through scrutiny on it, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay, members, any questions? You've all had a chance to read through the reports. I've got, have I got anyone online? Nope, got no one online either. Councillor Brooks. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, I'm not sure whether um, I did read the, the supplementary about the finances. Um, and I think I've missed something, um, Councillor um, Philip, but it would be helpful about moving the homelessness budget into the general Councillor fund. Councillor Brooks, we're not on that item at the moment. We're on the quarter two monitoring, which is on the main agenda. Oh. Right. Sorry. OK. Members, quarter two monitoring. The uh, report has been clearly given by Councillor Philip. Can I agree that report? Agreed. OK. We then move on to item 14A, any other bits for 14, any other business? And 14A, which is the draft budget 22-23. Councillor Phillip. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> as members will remember, um, I brought an earlier report to Cabinet which highlighted uh, a deficit of just over one and a half million for next year on the general fund. Um, Mr. Small and Mr. Hargrove and have been working very hard uh, on this uh, problem over the past uh, month and a bit. Um, and one of the key parts as well, um, because of the way we're working it, we've actually been able to go for a bottom-up approach. So this is actually coming from uh, the various service areas in terms of, of their budget and then feeding up into the budget rather than uh, us pushing things down the way. That gives us more uh, confidence that these figures are good figures and they're actually achievable with, by the various service areas. Um, I apologise because this report has been obviously very late to Cabinet. Uh, we've been working on it right through uh, Friday, I didn't see this until uh, into Friday. Um, I didn't actually read it until in the weekend. So we, we are late breaking. It's worth noting that in even where we've got to at the moment on this report, there are still a num significant number of uncertainties within it. Um, one I could highlight just from the last discussion that we had, uh, the projection was 30,000 from the Royden car park that's obviously a £30,000 hole we, we may be creating in the budget if we take the Royden Car Park out of, of this budget. The bigger issue, of course, is we, we do not yet have a view from the government of what our money coming in uh, next year will be. It, it is called out that uh, <clears throat> when they announced uh, earlier they were talking about spending power, Spending power is a factor of not just of what's coming from government, but how much tax they expect us to be raising as well. We have not changed our position at this stage that we are going for the £5 uh, rise on our council tax. 
I would much prefer to be able to balance my books without needing it, but realistically, both now and in the coming years, we're likely to need it to balance the books because the financial position is just getting harder. Um, we have been able to break uh, down the budget and actually balance it uh, from, from where we were, uh, and that's called out primarily uh, on page eight when we look at the evolution of the general fund budget. Um, there are some changes in this that are worth calling out. Uh, if we look at, for example, the homelessness uh, funding, that, that, that's been sitting in the HRA and being charged forwards and backwards over the period of time. It's not an HRA function. It should be sitting in the general fund and the HRA aspects will be cross-charged back to the HRA afterwards. So that makes, uh, that's the primary drive for that increase uh, in the employee costs. While I'm on employee costs, I do need to talk about uh, salary rises. Um, we funded uh, and budgeted in uh, last year for a particular level uh, of 1.5%. Um, we have kept uh, for next year 2%. Uh, as far as we go forward, that is the budget for our salaries. Um, if we end up with at a much higher uh, rate being an agreed point, and although we currently have local bargaining, uh, the way that that's structured, it's local bargaining, but only higher than the national scales, which doesn't give us a lot of room for movement in this situation. Um, we have that budget, that is a pot, if we need to spend more on individual salaries, then we need to have fewer individual salaries. It's not a message I want to bring forward, but it is the truth of where we are at the moment. We have been able to squirrel away a little bit that gives us a bit of flexibility, but that's where we are with that budget. Um, the other areas where we can see significant changes are in the financing costs. We've made some changes uh, in the fees and charges although we still obviously have to factor in that last report's changes that may come from that. Um, we have a change to our HRA recharges, and that's, that's the balance of bringing across the homelessness. Um, looking at the other ones, they're, they're all called out, but the bottom line is that instead of being um, one and a half million uh, overspend in this year's budget, uh, we have now balanced the budget with all the caveats I already mentioned. It is worth saying that if we do not manage to control costs this year, we will find ourselves with our general fund reserves below our minimum level. We have to start working out how we replenish those reserves. And if you look at the medium-term financial strategy later on, uh, in the appendices, you'll see that next year we're make, planning to make a contribution back into our reserves. It won't fix it completely, but at this stage that's as good as we can do. Um, the HRA hasn't changed significantly from where we are at the la on the last one, namely an, un an overspend this year and an underspend in the following year. The capital programs uh, still looking at uh, a significant amount of money over the next five years, um, namely 100, nearly 108 million uh, between now and 2026, 2027, and even more for the HRA capital program of 185 million. So this is a lot of money that we're looking at. Um, we do intend when we bring it to uh, the scrutiny panel to have much more detailed uh, service level budgets that have rolled up into this, but we'll actually present them at that. Uh, hopefully that'll give members confidence that they can see where that money is being spent. Um, and finally, uh, in Appendix D, Chairman, uh, the fees and charges, obviously we've talked about car parking already, that's in there. The, the majority of the changes uh, are minimal, but they're called out in detail in Appendix D on pages 30 to 34. No, no, 30, too far, there we are, to uh, 43, with the housing revenue charges uh, on page 43. 
And then starting on page 45, as I already uh, mentioned, the medium-term financial strategy, which takes us out to 2027, updated slightly um, as a result of the changes we've made to the budget for next year. Chairman, I'm happy to take questions. If they're significantly dated, I may well pass them to uh, Mr Small or Mr Hargrave. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Flip. Um, before we get started on questions, can I just put on a note and ask it to be minuted my thanks to yourself and the finance team, Mr Small, um, Chris, for all that's been done. I know it's been a, a really hard task to try and uh, put this budget together. It's, it's been difficult across um, many districts and boroughs and cities this year. Um, and the amount of work that's gone into it is absolutely terrific. So if we could just minute uh, before we get started on the debate, the thanks to officers and all, all involved in bringing this forward. Okay, members of the cabinet, any questions? Councillor Burrows. Um, could you tell me when do we expect the settlement from the government? And I want to point one other thing. I do notice you... Thank you, Councillor Philip. Thank you. Um, we expected around the 16th of December. Um, but, as with all these things, we have, we have seen it slip past when we expect it before. I, I think the worst we've seen, and uh, Councillor Whitbread, when he was finance portfolio holder, I think, I think you had a Christmas Eve delivery of it once, um, in the hope that uh, Mr Small and Mr Hargrove actually get some Christmas holiday. Uh, we hope it's earlier than that, but it, it, it's that sort of area. It should be coming in in the next 10 days or so. Uh, and yes, we are uh, putting money still towards the, the highways rangers with the apprentices. Um, I've always been a very strong advocate of growing our own where we possibly can. Uh, using apprentices is a great way of doing that. Great, thank you very much. Any other members of the Cabinet? Councillor Patel. Thank you, Chairman. I think uh, one of the things I'd like to draw on in, 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 in this uh, proposed budget is um, our reliance and greater reliance on Qualys uh, to, to deliver for us. Um, um, just, just looking at, obviously, from, from the interest charges, we're, we're, we're going to be generating a significant amount of income. But as those developments do start to come online, the, the additional income from them as well um, is going to be underpinning our services um, for the next decade or so as we move forward. Um, just something that's just caught my eye um, around, it's, it's on page 19, um, it's regarding the Disabled Facilities Grant. Um, they're saying there's a huge, huge spend in 26, 27. I know it's, I know it's quite a detailed question, it's probably not relevant now, but we can take it offline if perhaps, but just querying why why it's such a significant amount and, and why it's then and not split over this period of time. Chris. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember the precise accounting adjustment now. You've got me on that. I did this, this several weeks back. But um, uh, basically, just to reassure you that the uh, Disabled Facilities Grants are actually funded 100% by government grants, so there's no actual... Um, there's no actual um, expenditure commitment from the council on that point, uh, and um, all of those adjustments are offset by funding adjustments. So I can't remember the precise accounting adjustment now, but uh, rest assured it is cost neutral to the council. Thank you. That's good. Councillor Brooks. Thank you, Councillor Whitbread. Just a couple of queries. One relates to Appendix B and Appendix D, if that's okay, Councillor Philip. <clears throat> it's really, when we're looking at the HRA income, it's just a general query, and I didn't exactly know what our policy had been during the pandemic, looking at rental income from shops and our assets. Um, not, I'm not talking about housing. Um, in terms of, are we owed money still, or... Did we come to different arrangements? Um, what can we expect on that? And um, and the second one was really just about fees and charges. It, it was, I was just a bit perplexed as to why after school clubs have gone up by 40% when the others were much lower. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Philip. <clears throat> Thank you. Let, let me take a couple of things first. Um, uh, in, in terms of income uh, from 
shops, etc., we are in exactly the same position as any other landlord in terms of what we what action we can take. So yes, we are behind on that. Uh, from an asset management point of view, we're looking uh, to work out exactly what that uh, gap currently is. We're having problems with a new system that's been brought in and we haven't got a very good grasp on it yet. Um, so yes, we are owed. Um, if the other recovery from COVID symptoms that we're seeing within the district are showing we're actually recovering more quickly than most of our neighbours are. So that's a good story, both from uh, a council tax income and from rates and, and rents point of view. So we are working that one. Um, yeah. in, in, terms, in terms coming back to uh, Councillor Patel's point about quality, yes, we are very uh, reliant for some of our revenue on Qualys. That's partly why we set it up. It wasn't just uh, because we wanted to put, do our own development, but clearly in terms of what we're doing, the ability to uh, regenerate places within the district, it, which is what we're looking at going forward, and how that brings in uh, money to the council is key to keeping this um, budget balanced. Um, one of the challenges is going to be as Qualys looks for regeneration sites, they have to be regeneration sites that can be uh, financially attractive, but that does mean that we're a little bit dependent on them being there and coming forward at the right time to allow us to have the loan income at the right time, so there, there is pressure on there. And perhaps I could hand the last one across uh, to Mr Hargrove. Councillor Brooks, could you repeat the, your last question? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, it was just about fees and charges. Most of them were what I would yeah. have expected. So, so, that one back to the service and uh, get an answer to you on that one. I don't, I don't have okay. that answer off the top of my head. 40% did seem quite a lot for an after-school yeah. club increase at the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Brooks. Councillor Murray. I'm on, I'm on mute. Sorry, I'm okay now. Uh, I've, I've got uh, three questions, uh, and I thought one was going to be picked up by Councillor Brooks. She seemed to want to mention it in part one of the agenda. I was just a little bit concerned about the line in uh, employees' charges, where it kind of implied that we had, uh, had a cost centre in the HRA to the general fund. Uh, that sorry, in the HRA that should have been in the general fund, uh, which was actually illegal, because uh, the report says it reflects its, it now reflects its correct legal status. So how long has that been uh, been going on, and what's the impact that that has had on the, uh, on the uh, housing revenue account? Do you want me to do each question in turn, or do all three together? Uh, um, let's do each one, each one yeah, in turn. If, if, I, if I can come back on that one. Uh, no issue, no impact whatsoever. Councillor Murray, as I said in my presentation, uh, what had happened previously was that cost centre had sat in the H HRA and the general fund uh, charges were recharged across the general account. Um, what we're actually doing is we're moving it into where it should actually be so that any of the HRA aspect of that homelessness will then be cross-charged across to the HRA. It's doing it the other way around, but essentially it's putting it in the right place. Okay, so an absolute in, in assurance from you and the accountant that the HRA is paying legally what it should be paying for as regards homelessness and the general fund is paying what it legally should be paying for. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Murray, and that's that's what's called out, um, not, not just in there, but it, it calls it out further down um, on page eight in terms of the HRA recharges. You'll see that's a change of uh, 647 there, and it's because it's going the other way. Okay, lovely, thank you. So we haven't got a Nottingham situation that's uh, been recently reported. Okay, uh, my second area of, uh, isn't really a council issue, but it's a, 
how the government treats things differently. I'm glad Councillor Patel picked up the disability facilities grants on page 19. Uh, and I'm glad to hear it was confirmed that the government picks all those up because I did think that was the case. Uh, that then made me want to relook at page 26, the disabled adaptations, which is essentially the same thing. It's adaptations to homes, but in this case, it's uh, council homes. Uh, does the HRA have to pick all that up or do we get a similar generous uh, grant from the government to uh, pick up disability adaptations in council homes? Councillor Philip. Chairman, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know whether my colleague, the housing portfolio holder, knows the answer or whether Mr Hargrave is, is uh, I, I shaking can, his I hands. can find out and get back. OK, unless I'm very mistaken, I think you'll find the answer is no. Uh, and what a difference between how the government treats private sector housing and council housing. But I stand to be corrected. If I'm wrong, I apologise, but uh, I don't think I am. Sorry, uh, before, before we go forward, I think Councillor Whitbread wants to come in. Thank you, tomorrow. Chairman. I was just going to confirm that I, I think the answer is no, but I will go back and speak with officers just to yes. clarify the details. Yes, so you've got the current uh, housing portfolio saying that, and you've got a previous housing portfolio holder saying that. Uh, and it's just interesting, isn't it, that uh, private sector uh, grants for disability adaptation get reimbursed totally by the government, but uh, other council tenants have to pay for the uh, disability uh, adaptations of other council tenants. So just, you know, uh, worth highlighting. My second point, and uh, this will be upsetting some people, but I can tell you it will upset the general public. Yes, I don't disagree that the council chamber needs, you know, an, an upgrade in terms of what's been suggested, but 160,000. I just fell off my chair when I read that. I, I mean, I'm not a, an IT expert, but my, my brother-in-law did run a, a, a business in this kind of field. And uh, £160,000. It just seems to me that, you know, when it comes to our own offices, very little is actually spared. I, I would really like to know what, in some detail, not tonight, what we're getting for £160,000, because it really does sound state of the art. Yeah, thank you. I think Mr Small would like to come back on this one. Councillor Philip, are you happy? No, I'm quite happy for Mr Small to do it. I was going to say initially that I actually don't think that 160000 is an awful lot of money uh, in terms of a, a system for a place as complex as this that is also listed, uh, knowing very well that I've done uh, and a bit of work uh, in, a, in my own church at the moment around putting in, updating the, the audio system there, which is a lot simpler than we would have in the council chamber. Uh, and we have to bear in mind that it's not just the microphones. We've got microphones on, off, and there's the other technology there. But I'm happy to leave more detail to Mr Small. Mr Small. I, I think you stole the line that I was going to say, actually, uh, Councillor Philip. You're right, it, it's, it's a listed building, of course, which makes uh, any um, uh, upgrade more complicated than it would otherwise be. And, the, and as you say, the equipment is also complicated in its linkages and, uh, and uh, integration with other systems uh, makes it more difficult than it would otherwise be as well. I would say that that, that, that is a, a maximum provision that, that we're making, setting aside, but obviously we will go through a procurement exercise to make sure that, 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 um, that we get the best value for the council. But um, you know, we have to put something aside uh, against uh, an expected cost. And, and not only get one tender, Chairman. Yeah, point taken. Uh, and just adding that, I mean, when we're talking about this in the council chamber, one of the key parts I know that a number of members have had issues with is uh, the hearing loop. Um, the way that hearing loops are implemented, uh, they're supposed to be sitting at a particular uh, distance from, from the ear. And on a building like this that has multiple different levels, getting that to work in itself is going to be a significant piece of money. Yeah, absolutely. Right, any other members? Councillor Patel. Thank you for allowing me to come back, Leader. Um, questions on page 34 regarding the, uh, the venue hire charges. Um, what I wanted to understand is that when we, when we uh, set, set charges um, for, the, for the hire of our um, halls or spaces, do we calculate a square meterage 
cost of running um, of, 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 of running that particular um, sorry I can't get my words out no hmm? no no what, 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 what I'm getting at is um, do, do, do we know what it costs us to run um, or, or, or to actually provide that um, that room um, on, on, on a meterage basis so we can make a comparison as to how much actual income we're generating I think it's very difficult to do that in a practical way because we have costs uh, allocated, uh, costs incurring for those sites whether or not they are occupied. Um, so it doesn't make an awful lot of difference, for example, if you have the space open or closed, most of the charges are going to be the same. Um, I think the key part here is we need to make sure that when we make changes to our fees, we don't make them excessively on something like this. And you can see that the largest one is uh, the family fund workshops and toddler sessions that's gone up by 4%. So it's, it's not gone up by, by very much at all. Thank you, Councillor Phillip. Any other members? Members, you've got the recommend recommendations set out in the supplementary report. This is the first step as we move towards the full council meeting with the budget. Um, it's a well thought through paper, um, difficult decisions, and there'll be more difficult decisions over the medium term strategy for members to make. Um, we are entering choppier waters financially, um, and we're making some good decisions here this evening in order to enable that. As we heard, we won't know what the final funding settlement was until the 16th of December, if at the earliest, maybe before and that will enlighten some of the decisions again further that we're taking this evening. I would also say that, um, of course, one of the best things from the CSR was we thought we were going to get a three-year funding settlement. It now looks like we're going to get a one-year and then a two-year later on once the uh, department has looked at it in detail. So uh, more challenges for us in the years ahead. So what I would say to... Um, members is you've got these recommendations before you this evening there may be slight changes ahead of it but um, I take it the next meeting Councillor Philip will be the one with um, the select panel the joint select panel absolutely the stronger kind of select committee will be looking at this and can I encourage members <coughs> who've, who've either been uh, attending cabinet today or catching up on this on the webcast or, or whatever um, to if they have detailed questions, if they can let me know beforehand, I can hopefully find out the answers to them uh, rather than having to rely on the, th the three of our memory as good as they are. But as, as you've seen, the number of different things that go in to make the budget, if, if you give me a heads up, I will try and make sure we've got answers for you. Great, that's good. And as we can see tonight, the more information you have uh, asked beforehand, the better. Members, we've got the recommendations. Can I agree those recommendations? Thank you very much. And with that, that brings us to a close of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman.